Good morning, everyone. I'm, thank you. I'm Sarah Rosen Mortel, and I have the great honor and privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute and getting to thank you all for joining us today in person. And welcome to those of you who are watching our webcast now, which will be archived on the Urban Institute website. Um, let me encourage you first to uh, put aside your email, but not necessarily your phones, if you want to join the conversation online um, using uh, social media, if you would use the hashtag live at urban, and that way everyone will be able to see everyone's comments and conversations. Um, we're really honored today at Urban to be able to host Governor Lael Brainerd, the member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors and chair the Division of Consumer and Community Affairs, who's going to provide for some remarks and then a discussion with me and then with all of us about Community uh, Reinvestment Act modernization. Um, I suspect everybody in this room knows, but for the record, let me mention that on December 12th, the FDIC and the OCC proposed major revisions to CRA regulations regulations that haven't been meaningfully changed for 25 years. I think there is probably pretty widespread consensus that it is time for there to be CRA regulatory modernization, but far less consensus about what those new rules should be. And it was notable that the Federal Reserve did not join the FDIC and OCC in proposing those new rules. Governor Brainerd is here today to share her thoughts about CRA modernization. And it's a really special honor for me to host Dr. Brainerd at Urban because she was a colleague and great friend and mentor to me when we both served at the National Economic Council in the late 1990s. And she's really a terrific choice to lead the Fed's work on these issues. Lael is a PhD in economics from Harvard. She was associate professor of applied economics at MIT Sloan School of Management. And when we worked together, she was Deputy National Economic Advisor and Deputy Assistant to President Clinton. This was a role that had traditionally been in the National Security Council, the one she held. But Lael was at the NEC, where domestic economic issues happened, and functioned effectively in both organizations, making sure that the US domestic implications of um, trade and other international economic affairs were deeply considered. Um, and she really brought the concerns of families and communities into every one of those conversations. She also served as President Clinton's personal representative to the G7, G8. There, I learned that Lael is a pretty sophisticated diplomat, a highly technical analyst, a, an astute legislative strategist who can negotiate in a complex political context, and someone who also brings the cares of the average American into every room. She's always one who has sought an economy that worked for everyone and not just the powerful. After the Clinton administration, Governor Brainerd was the founding director of the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings, and then President Obama turned to her to serve as Undersecretary of the US Treasury um, until he tapped her to serve as a member of the Board of Governors beginning in 2014. And at the Fed, she has primary responsibility for overseeing the Division of Consumer and Community Affairs and been, has been leading the Federal Reserve's work on modernization of the Community Reinvestment Act. At this time, when CRA reform is at the top of the agenda, we could not be luckier than to have Lael Brainerd here with us today. Please join me in welcoming her. Well, good morning. It is uh, really a pleasure to be here uh, at the Urban Institute. I want to thank uh, Sarah Rosen Wortel for inviting me uh, to be here with you today. Uh, I will say uh, that uh, based on the work that we did together, uh, Sarah was uh, literally, I think, the first person I called when I learned I would have the good fortune of working on these issues because uh, I knew how much depth uh, and commitment she had in this area. The uh, Community Reinvestment Act uh, strengthening uh, modernization is a key priority for the Federal Reserve. The CRA plays a vital role in the ecosystem supporting economic opportunity in low and moderate income communities, and that's why we're so committed to getting CRA reform done right. Any successful reform must be grounded in the origins of the CEA and its ongoing importance to LMI neighborhoods. As is this one working or is this one working? This one. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, as one of the several landmark pieces of legislation enacted in the wake of the civil rights movement, the CRA was intended to reverse the disinvestment associated with years of government policies and market actions that deprived lower income areas of credit by using red inked lines to separate neighborhoods deemed too risky. At the Federal Reserve, we are very proud of the work we do in familiarizing banks with the CRA's provisions, introducing banks to potential partners in communities all around the country, and convening conferences to disseminate research and best practices. By conferring an affirmative and continuing obligation on banks to help meet the credit needs in all of the neighborhoods they serve, the CRA has not only prompted banks to be more active lenders in LMI areas, but also important participants in multi-stakeholder efforts to revitalize communities. By being inclusive in their lending and investing, banks help their local communities to thrive, which in turn benefits their core business. The recognition of that mutually beneficial relationship between banks and their local communities is one of the core strengths of the CRA and the reason that our effort to revise the CRA regulations must focus on local needs and stakeholder input. For several years, the federal banking regulators have been asking stakeholders for input on updating the CRA regulations. We've heard calls from banking and community organizations for the use of metrics to provide greater upfront clarity about evaluation standards. We've heard that branches remain as important as ever, even as the growth of mobile and online services has extended the geographic area that retail banks are serving. The one message we have heard most consistently is that banks and community organizations alike value the activities they undertake under the auspices of the CRA and have invested considerable time and effort in the associated processes and reporting. For that reason, stakeholders have asked the regulators to take care as we contemplate changes to CRA. If the past is any guide, major updates to the CRA regulations happen only once every few decades. So it is much more important to get reform right than to do it quickly. If we only have one opportunity for the next few decades, I want to make sure CRA reform is based on the best analysis and ideas and the broadest input available. Last year, we set out some principles to guide changes to the CRA. Any changes should reflect the credit needs of local communities and work consistently through the cycle. Changes should be tailored to banks of different sizes and business models. They should provide clarity in advance about how activities will be evaluated. They should encourage banks to seek opportunities in distressed and underserved areas, and they should recognize CRA is one of several mutually reinforcing laws to promote financial inclusion and access. Guided by stakeholder input, we evaluated how to use metrics to provide greater certainty about how activities will be evaluated while remaining faithful to the core purpose of CRA, which is to make credit and retail banking services available in LMI communities. So that's what I want to talk a little bit about here today. For starters, any proposed changes to the CRA regulation must be grounded in analysis and data to avoid unintended consequences. Because consistent data on CRA eligible activity weren't readily available, our research staff, under the guidance of Dan Ringo, set about creating a database based on over 6,000 written public evaluations from a sample of some 3,700 banks of varying asset sizes, business models, geographies, and bank regulators. The database includes the location, number, and amount of CRA-eligible loans and investments and the ratings associated with that bank's performance in the assessment area. The data ranged from 2005 to 2017 because we wanted to make sure we could assess those issues over the course of the economic cycle. So what metrics make sense to provide greater clarity about evaluations? I'll sketch out an approach based on a set of tailored thresholds that are calibrated for local conditions. It starts by creating separate tests for retail and community development activities. Broadly speaking, all retail banks would be evaluated under a retail test, which would assess a bank's record 
of providing retail loans and retail banking services in its assessment area. Large banks as well as wholesale and limited purpose banks would also be evaluated under a separate community development test that would evaluate a bank's record of providing community development loans, qualified investments, and services. Using bank and other publicly available data, we would be able to provide a bank with a dashboard in indicating how its retail lending activity compares to thresholds for the presumption of a satisfactory performance that reflect the activity of other lenders and credit demand in the local area. Separate metrics would be provided related to the evaluation of a bank's community development performance. Dividing evaluations in this way into separate retail and community development tests is a very important part of the proposed approach. First, evaluating all retail banks under a standalone retail test is important to stay true to the CRA's core focus on providing credit in underserved communities. In contrast, an approach that combines all activity runs the risk of encouraging some institutions to meet expectations primarily through a few large loans or community development investments rather than being tailored to local needs. Second, having separate tests ensures expectations are tailored for banks of different sizes and business models. Only larger banks would be expected to meet the community development test along with the full retail test. Smaller banks might have the option but not the obligation of having their retail banking services and community development activities evaluated in order to achieve an outstanding rating, but it wouldn't be required. And small banks below some asset size could opt to be evaluated under the existing methodology. Third, separate retail and community development tests provide greater scope to calibrate the evaluation metrics to the opportunities available in each market which often differ for retail lending and community development financing. After analyzing ways to use metrics across the board, we concluded the value of services to a local community doesn't lend itself easily to a monetary value metric comparable to the monetary value of loans and investments. Monetizing the value of services in any straightforward way could introduce the risk of skewing incentives. For example, the services and leadership provided by a small bank in a rural community may be vital to the success of that community, even if the dollar value of those service hours is small compared to a branch in a large city or a community development investment. Because of this concern, we're inclined to propose a set of qualitative criteria to evaluate services. So now let me turn specifically to the retail lending test. For that, it would use widely available data to assess two clear objectives, how well a bank is serving LMI borrowers, small businesses, and small farms in its assessment area, and how well a bank is serving LMI neighborhoods in its assessment area. The metrics used to evaluate those two questions would rely on loan counts rather than dollar value in order to avoid inadvertent bias in favor of fewer higher dollar value loans. They would be evaluated separately for each major product line in an assessment area, which is important in tailoring to a bank's business model. For instance, for mortgage loans, a LMI borrower distribution metric would calculate the percentage of a bank's number of loans made to LMI borrowers relative to its overall mortgage originations and assess this percentage against an assessment area threshold determined by local demographics and the aggregate lending of other in-market competitors. A separate LMI neighborhood distribution metric would evaluate the percentage of a bank's number of loans in LMI tracks to its overall loan count and assess this against a threshold determined by local demographics and the aggregate lending of other in-market competitors. So if you're a local bank, it might look a little bit like this. This approach measures a bank's performance in serving the needs of both LMI people and places in the community. A bank that meets or exceeds both the LMI borrower and LMI neighborhood thresholds for each of its major product lines, as this example bank does, would be presumed to have a satisfactory or better level of retail lending performance in that assessment area. Using a customized dashboard, like the one you see here, each bank could track its own activity 
against the threshold on an ongoing basis reflecting recent data, eliminating the lengthy uncertainty associated with the current evaluation methodology, which many banks highlighted as their top priority for reform. Importantly, the CRA database we've constructed confirms that the proposed retail lending metrics correlate well with past ratings of bank performance. So let me show you uh, a picture of that. So as you can see here, um, those banks that were rated satisfactory fall towards the middle of this spectrum. Those that were related outstanding tend to be more concentrated above that. And those who were rated needs to improve tend to fall below uh, a local set of performance thresholds. The specific thresholds that would establish a presumption of satisfactory performance could be informed by current evaluation procedures, which is a little bit what you're looking at here in the picture, but they need not be set at the same level, and public input will be important in informing those thresholds. So why is having uh, tailored thresholds, calibrated thresholds important? There are large differences between assessment areas which we would want to see reflected in the evaluations uh, as is the case today. For example, let's just take two counties, one Morgan County in Ohio, where LMI families are 49% of the population and compare it to O'Brien County in Iowa, where 31% of uh, families are LMI. Without tailoring, uh, we would be asking banks in these very disparate uh, areas uh, to meet uh, the same threshold. That's why we believe our approach is empirically sound and avoids imposing arbitrary CRA performance metrics on a bank and its community with the potential for unintended consequences. And as you all well know, the CRA requires that CRA activities be undertaken in accordance with safe and sound practices. In order to meet those standards, CRA lending must be evaluated in the context of the characteristics of both the bank and its community. This also pertains to tailoring for cyclical conditions. Importantly, the way we've constructed the retail lending thresholds, they would automatically adjust to changes in the business cycle. And we know from the NPR, the ANPR, many commenters noted that a uniform ratio that doesn't adjust with the local business cycle could provide too little incentive to make good loans during an expansion and incentives to make unsound loans during a downturn which could be inconsistent with the safe and sound practices mandated by the CRI statute. Industry commenters also express concern that discretionary adjustments to a uniform metric are likely to lag behind the cycle and undermine the certainty that a metric would be seeking to provide. And as you can see from this picture, Lending activity varies very substantially with the economic cycle, and that is why it's very important in the way that we've constructed the proposed lending, retail lending metrics, that they are calibrated to contemporaneous changes in market conditions. Finally, the proposed approach would continue to recognize local context in assessing performance in a number of additional ways if a bank were to receive a presumption of satisfactory by meeting or exceeding its thresholds, an examiner could consider performance context information, including the bank's responsiveness to the community's needs, in determining whether the bank's performance is outstanding. Likewise, if a bank doesn't meet or exceed the thresholds, it would undergo a full examination, just as it would today, and could receive any level of rating, including possibly outstanding, based on the full range of performance context considerations. So the metrics are designed to provide certainty while avoiding rigidity. Finally, as we know, retail services can be extremely important to low and moderate income communities, although they don't easily lend themselves to consistent comparable metrics. In this area, it makes sense to use qualitative criteria related to the responsiveness of a bank's products and services and its delivery systems, which stakeholders highlighted as being particularly important in LMI areas. In terms of delivery systems, we recognize the unique and important role branches play in providing essential financial services to communities and customers in underserved areas. 
banks would be evaluated on their branch and ATM locations and how well they serve customers using online and mobile access channels. Providing a meaningful evaluation of all customer access channels is essential to ensuring CRA remains relevant as banks increasingly adopt digital access technology. Recognizing that branches are important community assets, the proposed retail services test would compare a bank's distribution of branches, including openings or closings, with broader patterns in the region. A recent report on branch access in rural areas found that just over 40% of rural counties lost bank branches between 2012 and 17, with 39 rural communities being deeply affected by the loss of more than half of their branches. In addition to the higher cost and less convenient access to banking services, community leaders described how branch closers diminished their access to important leadership from branch personnel that was important to their community success. Now let's turn to the community development test for large retail banks, as well as wholesale or limited purpose banks. The establishment of a separate community development test reflects stakeholder feedback, emphasizing the value of community development finance is distinct and not directly comparable to retail lending. A separate test also allows for a broader area to be taken into account for purposes of community development relative to retail activities. The proposed metric would aggregate loan and investment dollars that are originated or purchased during the evaluation period with the book value of all other community development loans and investments that are held on the bank's balance sheet. Reflecting input from banks and community organizations that patient committed financing has the greatest impact, this approach avoids current incentives to provide financing in the form of short-term renewable loans in order to receive CRA credit. The proposed test would compare the combined measure of a bank's community development financing relative to deposits in its local assessment area to a national average set differently for rural and urban areas and a local average in the bank's assessment area. The use of a national rural or metro comparator in addition to an assessment area comparator is intended to avoid skewing incentives towards financially dense areas that are already hotly competitive and to reflect the value of community development in underserved areas. The national comparator would be set differently for metropolitan statistical areas and rural areas to reflect the comparatively lower average levels of financial infrastructure in rural communities. And you can see that here in this slide, both uh, that it's important to distinguish between urban and rural areas on average, and it's also very important to scale the metric to local conditions given how vastly different the CD opportunities uh, are in different areas. It's also important to recognize that community development finance is often provided in areas that don't meet, uh, fit neatly within a bank's branch-based assessment area. Community development financing opportunities aren't always easy for banks to identify and often depend on working with local nonprofits or governments to help identify projects and put together the complex financing required to bring them to fruition. Stakeholder feedback emphasized banks' unique advantages in evaluating community development projects in the states and territories where they operate and providing the smaller scale, more complex, and often more impactful investments overlooked by institutional investors. For this reason, and to encourage more activity, it makes sense to give consideration to all of a bank's community development activities in a state or territory where it has an assessment area. Banks want to know in advance they will get the benefit of CRA consideration in order to invest the time and effort necessary to evaluate and structure CD loans and investments. And for that reason, we're sympathetic to requests for a process by which banks could seek conditional examiner review. And we're optimistic about establishing a timely process, particularly for activities that revitalize and stabilize targeted areas. Finally, qualitative criteria make sense to evaluate services as part of the overall community development test. For instance, in areas with a low density of financial services, the service of a bank officer on the board of local community organizations can provide considerable value that isn't accurately reflected by simply monetizing volunteer hours based on their local compensation. 
Let me turn to tailoring, which is an important principle for uh, the reforms that we're proposing. The targeted approach to assessing CRA performance would tailor performance metrics to bank size and business strategy, as well as to local and cyclical conditions. It would tailor to banks' business models by establishing the separate uh, thresholds for substantially different lending products, such as mortgage loans, small business, small farm, and consumer loans, as well as separate tests for retail lending and community development financing. The proposed metrics would also be inherently tailored for different bank sizes. This is facilitated in part by allowing very small banks to retain the current evaluation procedures, and in part by creating a separate community development test that would apply only to large banks. Tailoring is also an important consideration in data collection and reporting requirements. The proposed retail lending approach is designed so that it can be implemented in significant part with data that is already readily available. In designing the community development approach, we've been mindful of burden as we consider any additional data that might be required to implement those metrics. Finally, as previously noted, the metrics are tailored for local conditions and cyclical variations. So let me conclude by just spending a moment reflecting on where we go from here. Staff across the Federal Reserve System have devoted substantial time and effort to engaging with the other banking agencies in the CRA reform process. The analysis, data, and proposals I've discussed here today have all been shared in greater detail with our counterparts at the other banking agencies in an effort to forge a common approach. We were hopeful our proposed approach could be incorporated into the proposed rulemaking that was released last month in order to seek a public comment on a range of options. Based on the best available data, we concluded that CRA metrics tailored to local conditions and the different sizes and business models of banks would best serve the credit needs of the communities that are at the heart of the statute. This tailored approach using targeted metrics also yielded more consistent and predictable overall ratings than any comprehensive uniform metric. Moreover, a uniform comprehensive threshold could have unintended consequences because such a ratio wouldn't reflect local conditions, which can vary greatly between communities and over the cycle. A bank could exert the same amount of effort in different areas or different points in the cycle with very different outcomes. We continue to believe that a strong common set of interagency standards is the best outcome. By sharing our work publicly, we hope to solicit public input on a broader set of options for reform and find a way towards interagency agreement on the best approach, whatever that is. The process of sharing the data and analysis, informing regulatory proposals, and seeking public feedback on them is critical to the regulatory process. Given that reforms to the CRA regulations are likely to set expectations for a few decades, it is more important to get the reforms done right than to do them quickly. This requires giving external stakeholders sufficient time and analysis to provide meaningful feedback on a range of options. Let me conclude by noting that the high level of engagement and commitment on the part of banks, community organizations, and other important stakeholders give me confidence that we will succeed in strengthening CRA's core purpose of helping banks affirmatively meet the credit needs of their local low and moderate income communities. Thank you. Well, for those of you who thought that there was a whole lot of content there, if you have not already found your way uh, to the Federal Reserve's website, uh, Lael's speech is uh, posted there. It will also be posted on the event page uh, at Urban, and I hope the slides as well. So you'll have access to all of the information uh, that was public. And in uh, that spirit of transparency, let me start just with a process question, if I would. You referred to this a number of times as a proposal. And let me see if I inter can interpret what you said correctly, and you can uh, amend and restate if necessary. It sounds as though what you're doing is inviting the public to use this as part of the backdrop in submitting their comments to the outstanding ANPR, or, or Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. 
In other words, you're hoping that this becomes part of the debate, but you're not planning to issue your own proposal separately at this time. Is that a fair reading of the facts? So I would say uh, we certainly want to share all the analysis that we've done. I think we have thought through um, in a very detailed way an approach uh, that we think uh, stays true to that core purpose of the uh, Community Reinvestment Act. Um, precisely uh, how we engage uh, in this discussion, I think, is something that we're still um, deliberating. Um, and so we haven't actually uh, decided uh, what kinds of um, path uh, forward we might be taking, but we certainly are going to uh, share the approach, uh, the underlying uh, analysis uh, with uh, the public, and we hope that we'll get feedback starting uh, with this quite detailed uh, speech I gave today, um, we're really looking to hear from external stakeholders. I strongly suspect there are a few people in this room who will take you up on that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let me actually ask you to step back for one second um, and uh, reflect for a moment on uh, the sort of world that we're in and why we need to be doing this in the first place. Um, it is true that formal redlining that was what prompted this act in the first place is further in our rearview mirror now um, than it's been in the past, but also true uh, that we've learned how both racism and poverty has kind of woven itself into the fabric of our society and that the uh, need for CRA, if you will, is as strong as ever. Um, can you just reflect for a moment on what you in your view, are the things that make modernization of CRA so important right now? What were both um, the larger societal need and the um, problems with the current regulations that you think make it so important to take this on? Well, so first, uh, let me just say, as a lot of uh, the analysis uh, from uh, the Urban Institute um, and at the Federal Reserve shows, uh, we have uh, still uh, very large challenges in making sure uh, that LMI communities, uh, underserved communities, do uh, benefit from access to uh, mainstream uh, finance. And so it's a very important uh, agenda across the Federal Reserve System. We have people dedicated uh, to community development in every one of our uh, banks across the system, in every one of our Federal Reserve banks. And I will say, that in all of our stakeholder outreach, uh, both banks and community development organizations, people who are engaged in the work of the CRA on the ground are extremely committed to it. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, common um, commitment to build on. Uh, what has changed? A lot has changed in the 25 years since the uh, regulation uh, was last uh, updated. Interstate uh, branching. Uh, has changed. Uh, the modes of delivery uh, that uh, banks use to reach customers uh, are uh, now increasingly enhanced by uh, mobile and online uh, delivery channels. Uh, so uh, in the community development field and community development organizations have flourished uh, for a variety of different reasons having to do uh, with changes in several administrations during that time. So it's a very vibrant uh, ecosystem that CRA is at the heart of, we want to make sure that we preserve uh, all the uh, positive benefits that LMI communities derive from that vibrant ecosystem while making sure that uh, new bank business models are well reflected. And there are metrics that we can use, and I think we're sympathetic to that. Why not use metrics in a targeted, tailored way to provide that kind of certainty? So you actually anticipated my next question. I think there are some who have been worried that any use of a sort of metrics approach kind of can't uh, take into uh, uh, consideration all of the context. On the other hand, you've talked a lot about the importance of using metrics, but yet tailoring. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you got comfortable with the notion of metrics and then uh, sort of the, you've chosen to split your metrics much more granularly than others and just a little bit about the underlying reasoning for that. 
So I think we read, um, well, first of all, uh, even before um, we got comments on uh, the ANPR, we had had a lot of stakeholder outreach uh, through the AGRIFRA process, uh, even earlier than that, before I got to the Fed. So we had already heard um, from a lot of um, stakeholders that they thought that uh, better use of, uh, or more use of metrics uh, was an area that could lead to uh, greater certainty for banks um, and greater um, activity generally. Um, so we took that on, but we thought if you're gonna use metrics, uh, it's extremely important uh, that there not be unintended consequences. So you have to start by building a database and analyzing what metrics actually do correlate well with the outcomes that CRA mandates um, and which are less likely to produce those uh, results and which could, which kinds of metrics might in fact produce uh, unintended consequences contrary um, to the spirit of the statute. And so that is why we built this database, um, which is a very rich database based on current CRA evaluations um, and look to the greatest extent possible for ways of creating a set of metrics that would be familiar to the organizations that are in this space. Um, so there wouldn't be an enormous amount of burden on institutions in terms of collecting um, new data. Um, and that it would be accessible publicly so that uh, CRA can continue to be uh, an arena that brings uh, stakeholders together around a common set of understandings. Um, and for that, it was very important to make uh, both the targeted tailored metrics, ones that banks are familiar with and can access, but also that the public will be familiar with and can access. So I want to ask a question, and apologies if I am not sure I fully understood the proposal yet. But um, one of the things that has been of concern is as you do a better job, and I think your proposal sounds like you're seeking to do that, and I know the other proposals out there do, to allow um, a particularly community development, economic development activity to count in new ways, um, that it could have the unintended effect of creating less incentive to do some of the more retail services that have long term been a focus of the act. Um, and so one question is you think about the levels where these metrics are set, and you haven't specified that here. Is our goal to, to just make sure that we're asking the same uh, level of support from these institutions to our communities? Are we suggesting that perhaps particularly right now we might seek more consistent with safety and soundness? Sort of what's your thinking about the leveling and what are we trying to achieve here from so I think the first thing, because you mentioned services, I just want to um, make clear that, in fact, we did find some areas where we just did not think metrics are the best way of assessing. And services, really, both retail services and community development services, we uh, thought long and hard about it um, and uh, believe that clear qualitative criteria are the best way of tailoring uh, services evaluations. With regard to financing activities, both retail lending and community development um, and finance, um, in those areas, uh, we now, I think, have both a database and a set of uh, metrics that we have validated um, lead to the kinds of outcomes that the CRA statute is mandating. Um, but precisely where those thresholds are set would be uh, something that one would want to have a public conversation about. And I think it's precisely the, along the lines that you suggest. We could probably replicate um, with some um, precision uh, today's uh, level of expectations, but perhaps that's not what the public and the institutions um, think is the best path forward. But what this would give you is a set of clear uh, metrics with the kinds of outcomes that the uh, statute uh, mandates so that you could actually have an informed conversation about what the desired level of those thresholds should be. So those who've been reading the um, <coughs> FDIC OCC proposal are familiar with a lot of attention given to um, 
how do you measure different kinds of community development activity, particularly sort of economic development activity of a kind that has not been treated consistently in the past. Infrastructure, large-scale economic development, public amenities, that sort of thing. Um, your proposal is focused a lot on the mechanics, so I didn't hear much. Be interested just to hear your thinking about the importance, the value, and the risks of giving more credit to those kinds of activities. Yeah, so I think as we um, have thought about some of, so today I really uh, focus very much on the metrics pieces, but obviously there's some other pieces that we've given some consideration to as well. And there are um, uh, questions about uh, what projects would be likely to receive approval and the, um, I think, uh, legitimate request uh, that banks who are going to put a lot of time and energy uh, into doing the requisite due diligence on those projects we need to get a sense ahead of time um, whether or not those projects are going to count. We think that is um, a very legitimate uh, need, uh, particularly in areas uh, such as revitalization and stabilization where there's some real judgment calls that need to be made. But in terms of how those calls would be made, I think the statute provides um, a core uh, uh, purpose uh, that would inform how those kinds of judgments would be made. So there's one issue is getting that signal ahead of time in a more timely uh, process, which I think is very legitimate. But the, um, the, the criteria continue, in our view, to have to be rooted uh, in the needs of LMI communities because that is what is in the statute. So one uh, virtue some might argue, of the uh, OCC proposal is that at the end of the day, it all rolls up. Um, in your proposal with this much more, there are metrics, but they're more granular. Um, how do you think at the end of the day, does a bank, can they anticipate if they're satisfactory here and they're uh, extraordinary here? So how is that going to end up sort of um, uh, move, helping them to move forward? Would they end up with sort of a, five report cards, if you will? So uh, banks currently are accustomed to getting different ratings in different assessment areas. Um, and how those roll up to an overall rating is something that you can add more structure around. That's, um, that is uh, straightforward to do. I think, in fact, um, putting myself in the position of a bank, uh, the kinds of dashboards um, that we presented here uh, would be actually pretty um, uh, helpful uh, in an in a almost real-time basis for banks to know where are they tracking in their assessment area, and they know how assessment areas tend to add up, um, both on retail lending in the areas that they actually are making um, products available, as well as on community development and finance for larger institutions or wholesale limited purpose. Um, so it gives them a lot of certainty um, as they are undertaking their activities, where they are likely to be. And that uh, delay and uncertainty that banks are most concerned about, we actually think would probably be addressed better um, by these dashboards uh, than other uh, uh, possible approaches. Um, so I want to talk, you're at the Urban Institute, so excuse us for focusing on data and transparency issues, but that's in our DNA. So there are two aspects of that I want to focus on. I think the first is around these analysis. You described that you're going to make the analysis that the uh, Reserve Board staff have done public, which is fabulous. Um, uh, I'd be curious about the information that you had to create that analysis. How much of that we've struggled as we've tried to do analysis of some of these issues with the quality of information that we have access to even today. Um, so how much of the information you used is widely available and can be replicated and what's not? So what we tried to do with the retail lending metrics was to use uh, widely available um, uh, counts uh, so that uh, they would be accessible. Um, and that is why uh, HMDA reporting and CRA reporting uh, data is so important because it allows um, both community uh, organizations and banks to have conversations based on the same set of facts. Um, in terms of ratings, uh, they are available, but you have to pull them uh, from you know, the copies that are posted, and that is what we did. Um, and so we constructed uh, a database uh, based on written evaluations 
and then combine that with uh, other data. So that, um, that data we hope to make available. Um, we certainly will make the analysis from uh, that data available, but that's the kind of database that I think you need to construct in order to provide the kind of analytical um, foundations for a major rulemaking. Uh, so that, again, we can uh, be confident uh, that there wouldn't be uh, unintended consequences. Now, some of the um, CD uh, test uh, data would require uh, more data collection. We think that makes sense um, for larger institutions, institutions with uh, business models uh, that lend themselves to that. Um, but there, too, we've been very mindful of how much additional data burden might be uh, required. So I think um, as I read the OCC proposal, there is actually additional reporting required of institutions beyond what they do today to the agencies, but actually perhaps less or less granular data to be made publicly available, um, particularly by rolling up to larger areas and some of the reporting and to report on a more macro level uh, publicly. You talked in your remarks earlier about the power of CRA data as setting a table. That's something we like to do a lot at Urban, is bring community data to a conversation. And then stakeholders have some facts on the ground. Sometimes they have alternative sources of information too, but you start a conversation around the facts. And so um, how do you think about um, the importance of the transparency? I you mentioned those dashboards would be available to the public, how frequently? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think, again, the retail lending is pretty straightforward because um, the metrics, uh, the community comparators, the neighborhood comparators, the borrower um, comparators are based on largely on, on publicly available data. The community development uh, area would require um, some additional um, uh, data um, collection and uh, reporting in a more consistent format. Um, of course, that would be uh, magnified uh, in other proposals that are out there. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, we have a much more limited uh, set of additional data that would need to be collected, again, for, for larger institutions. Uh, we do think it's important. Uh, CRA is all about um, having uh, banks and um, communities be able to work together. So we do think the uh, transparency and uh, public nature of that data is very important. And of course, that is what is intended um, by the requirement to post uh, CRA evaluations and make them available. It's simply that those aren't done in a way that allows the data to be easily um, uh, used in um, uh, larger uh, analytical exercises. So let me ask one last question, and then um, we're going to ask uh, the audience if they want to ask questions, emphasis on questions, uh, <laughs> in, uh, to, to the governor. Um, so uh, this is an alternative approach, an approach that um, uh, is one that clearly has been, there's a lot of effort and energy went, and obviously a, a major analytic effort to put together. Um, you mentioned that there had been significant dialogue around this approach already between the regulators uh, for some time. Um, and at the moment, there, it is a different approach than the one that was put out by the other two uh, regulatory bodies. If we end up in a world in which um, uh, consensus cannot be found, um, how do you think about the advantages and potential disadvantages of having different regulatory regimes? Yeah, so it's definitely um, extremely important uh, to eventually uh, find common ground uh, and have uh, one interagency rule. Uh, the path to getting there, um, I think, is a little bit, uh, you know, there are a variety of ways uh, that uh, we could potentially get there. Um, but uh, I think uh, we also want to make sure um, that uh, any rulemaking that we do, we feel really confident um, about uh, that rulemaking furthering the core purposes of the statute. Uh, so while I think we, we uh, hope and are uh, very um, 
uh, did, yeah, sort of engaged in trying to get uh, to a common interagency uh, rule ultimately that, you know, that is our goal. Um, we also need to make sure that whatever rulemaking uh, is uh, absolutely grounded in the core purpose of the statute. All righty. Um, so uh, I suspect we have no shortage uh, <laughs> uh, comments. Um, so uh, can we bring the lights up just a little bit? That's great. Why don't we start in the front with Marietta? And I, could I ask everyone, if you would, please, to identify yourself in any organization that you're with? Good morning. Marietta Rodriguez, Neighbor Works America. Thank you, Governor Brainerd, for your thoughts and your team's efforts to really think thoughtfully about how this impacts communities. One question I had as you were going through the metrics is, particularly in light of what's happened recently in Puerto Rico with the recent earthquakes, and they hadn't yet really recovered from the hurricane, um, how, how do you think about um, the CRA structure in light of serving underserved communities that are also in distress from disaster? Yeah. So first of all, I, you know, I, I share um, the uh, you know, deep distress at uh, people in Puerto Rico having just, uh, just barely uh, starting to um, uh, be able to reconstruct uh, after those devastating hurricanes to now having experienced a devastating earthquake. Um, as uh, I think many people know, um, because of uh, the natural disaster uh, status, uh, CRA consideration was already extended uh, to Puerto Rico. I think that continues through September of this year. Um, and obviously, so projects uh, can continue to be made with confidence uh, about the CRA consideration. And then as we get towards uh, September, uh, obviously the three banking agencies will work uh, to see if, in fact, it's appropriate to extend that status. And, Certainly, I can imagine uh, that the, uh, the inclination there would be affirmative. Um, David, give us a minute. David Dworkin with the National Housing Conference. And thank you so much for this. And thank you to the Urban Institute for the incredible data analysis you've already provided. Uh, my question is, um, in over 90 meetings at the Treasury Department in 2017 with stakeholders, mostly financial institutions, no one recommended moving towards a ratio-driven approach. Um, that's clearly in play now, and um, you've introduced this metric-driven approach. How would you contrast and compare these two, and is there middle ground? Uh, if there is, what does that look like? So I, I've been really very focused on our proposed approach because I think you're all familiar with the um, NPR that was uh, put out. Um, and so I don't want to characterize any other possible approaches, but we certainly did take into account um, any possible uh, path forward and tested that. Um, and uh, I, I would say that our analysis suggested that any comprehensive uh, and uniform metric um, uh, does run the risk of having unintended consequences, does have the risk of not being um, responsive to local community needs, uh, which we believe is um, important uh, to the statute. That said, um, we're all trying to uh, solve the same problem, which is to bring greater certainty and clarity kind of on an ongoing basis rather than having to wait three years to know where you are on your C CRA ratings. And of course, the activities lend themselves to roughly the same kinds of metrics. So I think there's a lot of common ground uh, between uh, the two approaches. Um, and in fact, you know, I think, as I said earlier, it, it would have been, uh, I think, very beneficial to perhaps put both approaches into a rulemaking and allow public comments to kind of um, look at uh, pluses and minuses of both approaches so that we would, in fact, end up with the best possible approach between the two. So that's still my hope, uh, is that we have a really good, robust public debate. Um, we can't really know how any of these metrics uh, are going to work until um, the people who are most engaged in CRA activity uh, look at them, compare them with how they operate currently, and give us feedback on, yeah, I think this could work, 
here's a problem that you didn't anticipate. Why don't you do it this way? We need that kind of feedback to get to that best uh, middle ground and have a joint rule. Buzz Roberts, you could bring the mic down the front. Thank you. Hi, Governor Raynard, Buzz Roberts from uh, National Association of Affordable Housing Lenders. Thanks for your very thoughtful comments. Um, one super brief comment, the more data you can provide, the more your anal analysis that underlies uh, these recommendations, the sooner would be better. Uh, but I had uh, a question for you about one of the main differences between uh, what you've laid out and what OCC and the FDIC have suggested, and that is their primary focus on uh, uh, loans and investments on a bank's balance sheet. You're focused more on originations supplemented by balance sheet on community development. Why did you decide to go with originations rather than balance sheet as the principal uh, approach? Yeah. Um, so in the area of retail lending, um, we thought what was uh, uh, most important um, is measuring um, the extent to which uh, LMI individuals, families, and LMI areas were being served by those retail lending uh, products, and that that was best reflected by loan counts, uh, that the actual size of those loans um, would not be a good reflection of the um, value of that service, because, of course, if you're in a higher uh, uh, sort of income area generally, you're going to see larger loan values, but that's not going to really speak to the value to that LMI family. Um, and it's those originations that matter um, in uh, some products where there's a very active secondary market. Uh, community development uh, arena is different. They're, uh, they're much less uh, developed, very little developed uh, secondary market. So better uh, to uh, measure the commitment of an institution by the sum total of its activity. And we heard a lot, and this was a big theme coming out of our Philadelphia uh, Reserve Bank Conference, um, that we wouldn't uh, want to be providing incentives to institutions to turn over financing on a short-term basis just to get a CRA rating. Uh, that much more meaningful was that commitment value of the financing. and so that we should scope in um, both investments and loans on a comparable basis and scope in balance sheet commitments uh, uh, to measure that. Um, so that's why uh, that difference uh, we thought made sense. But again, uh, we'd be interested in, in uh, alternative views on that. Good. Jesse? Jesse Vantall, CEO of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. And first, uh, thanks, Sarah, for hosting this important discussion and for getting some great questions uh, already off the table. Uh, Governor Brenner, thank you for your leadership uh, on this issue. I've said that I think the Federal Reserve has put itself in the position of being really the best regulator or the only regulator to promulgate a sustainable rule for a variety of reasons across political cycles, across economic cycles, based on the analysis, uh, you know, data-driven approach you've taken, the database you've constructed. And my question is about that. I know you've focused largely on your own proposal. And I want to ask if you've, in addition to modeling what the impact on grades are, modeling the impact, the actual impact on lending, on investing, on services, and if not, I'd encourage you to do so. But also, have you looked at the OCC and FDIC proposal? Uh, part of the problem with that proposal is much of the data, the basis for determining certain thresholds, setting up the structure, is really not available to the public. And so we're at a disadvantage with a 60-day comment period to even analyze what the impact is. I'll give you a for example. Because of the inclusion of consumer lending, it appears to me that several large banks would fulfill the dollar volume metric many times over in an outstanding rating on the basis of their subprime auto and credit card lending alone. Uh, and so 
uh, you know, it appears to us that some of these benchmarks are arbitrary, certainly not measurable easily in, in 60 days. And I wonder if you've taken a look at the impact uh, uh, of, of that approach. Thank you. Well, let me um, say uh, that uh, we would have considerable unease um, just because of the requirements of rulemaking, um, putting out rules um, with um, thresholds uh, that are not grounded in uh, data. Um, and so I, I won't speak to any particular proposal that's out there, um, but we did think uh, that if we were going to be able to support a metrics-driven approach that we needed to be able to have the data and analysis to validate that approach uh, and to uh, be quite confident that there would not be unintended consequences, um, again, rooted in that core purpose of the statute. So having, uh, as regulators, um, the requisite data uh, in itself, I think, uh, is an extremely important um, hurdle uh, to putting out a, a good uh, proposed rulemaking. Got a Priya in the back. Wait for the mic. Priya Jayachandran with the National Housing Trust. Perhaps overly simplistic, but the way that I think about the two proposals is the difference between a GPA and a set of three or four grades. In your proposal, what's the implication of a bank getting, let's say, three, four A's and one D? What would be the consequence in your mind of that D? And what's the incentive for that bank to come up to a B or better an A? Yeah, so this question about um, how do you aggregate across areas of activity and then across assessment areas. That comes up actually um, certainly across assessment areas in either approach uh, that you look at because all larger institutions are going to have multiple assessment areas. Now we have a current um, mechanism for doing that. Um, and again, um, we uh, I think would uh, seek public input on whether the current approaches are um, broadly uh, in line with the kinds of incentives one would provide to uh, implement the core purpose of the CRA, or whether there might be some uh, particularly important areas of activity um, or uh, other considerations that maybe current approaches are not capturing. So really, we would be looking, um, again, uh, for public input. Now we've got a set of agreed uh, metrics. Uh, you know how they work. Um, how, how would they best uh, be aggregated together to, again, uh, implement that core purpose of the CRA? Let's go to the back of the room this time, geographic areas. Um, hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. I, I wanted to ask about timing. I, I know that, um, Governor Brainerd, you said that, you know, the board is still deliberating what its approach is going to be, um, but given that the other agencies seem to have uh, sort of a, a more specific timeline. I mean, Comptroller Odding has said he wants to put out a final rule, um, I, I think, by May. Um, so is, is there a certain timeline by which you, you would need to, to make a decision, given that the goal is to come to a final agreement with the other two agencies? Um, is, is, you know, is some kind of proposed rule in the next few months the ideal uh, outcome? What was your thinking on that? Yeah. So. I um, have uh, really um, given a lot of thought to this issue of timing. Um, CRA does not get uh, revised frequently. As Sarah mentioned, it's been 25 years uh, since the last major rewrite. And uh, what all of the agencies are talking about here is a major rewrite of the CRA. Um, in those circumstances, uh, and because a lot of institutions, most institutions say they like CRA, they are familiar with it, it is working well. Um, it is so much more important, in my view, to get this done right than to get it done fast. So I think we don't have that same kind of um, sense of uh, 
that there's uh, a time uh, deadline here. What uh, we are focused on is making sure uh, that we are true to the core purpose of the CRA. And if that takes a little longer to get the necessary input, um, what matters is the quality of the rulemaking. Over here in this corner there. Good morning. Uh, Daryl Getter from the Congressional Research Service. Um, in your remarks, you had mentioned where some banks were frustrated because they have to wait to figure out if they're going to get CRA credit before they do a loan. And that just sort of made me wonder, was that a reference to like the small business investment corporations? Or are there some loans where if the bank gets CRA credit for it, they get more favorable risk weight treatment? Or do you have an example, even if it's anecdotal, where a bank might walk away from a profitable lending opportunity because they're not getting CRA credit from it. Thank you. It's, it's really not in the retail lending area. It's really in the community development investments and sometimes uh, lending area where um, some of these uh, investments are part of broader uh, projects uh, in a community. And uh, so uh, there may be broader economic development uh, benefits our job uh, as CRA examiners is to make sure um, that to get it, it credit for CRA that the underlying purpose of the CRA is being served. So for instance, in the area of revitalization stabilization projects, we would really want to look at community benefits and benefits going to LMI neighborhoods and LMI families within that, and that's why sometimes there's some ambiguity. Um, and what uh, is being requested, which I am very sympathetic to, is to be able to engage with the examiner before the investment is being made, while the investment is being considered, um, so that uh, the banking institution would have uh, confidence or greater confidence. Okay. Can we get um, Mike in the middle? Uh, I'll project. Uh, we have a recording, okay. so if you would, thank you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for this important forum, and thank you, Governor Brainerd. Um, the question is really about a retail, uh, retail metric. Um, if you look at the OCC and FDIC proposal, one of the metrics, for example, if, if you're two-thirds of the way to the aggregate peer, you pass. So let me give you an example. Aggregate peer is 25% of loans to low and moderate income people. Two-thirds of that is 16%. You pass. That's a much lower bar than currently. Um, if you could comment, well, not only on that, but on yours, where you had the graph and you said, well, using our revised metrics, the distribution is kind of the same. So in other words, the same, same number and percent of banks earning outstanding, same number and percent earning satisfactory. It's not that I want to see a whole lot of more banks fail. But 90% of institutions now get satisfactory. And that does not seem realistic. There are, within that 90%, there are some that are really doing the work, and there is others that are not. I would like that 90% bucket at least split up into two. Um, so you, either it's another rating or it's a point system. And it's also thinking through these metrics, you know, is uh, three quarters of the way to the aggregate peer really a low satisfactory, for example? So, you know, if you could comment a little bit about, about that. Yeah. So um, I think what is important um, when you propose a set of metrics is that you know um, how institutions would have performed under those metrics. So you can calibrate those metrics. So the picture I was showing you um, was if you wanted to be confident that the methodology is true to existing evaluation mechanisms which are rooted in the statute, um, you just want to know that you could actually see that really clear separation between the institutions that are deemed to be outstanding, those that are satisfactory, and those that are needs to improve. Um, and so it gives me um, some uh, confidence when I see that kind of graph that you can choose thresholds. And remember, we've got a number of thresholds that underlie those bubbles um, relative to demographics, relative to um, 
uh, neighborhoods um, where you can. Then you might ask yourself, well, is that my goal? Or is my goal to change the distribution in such a way that we, over time, might uh, cr create a higher bar or a lower bar? I think the point of the picture is simply to show you that um, we can actually make that judgment. We can have that conversation based on actual data and analysis. And you can see how that distribution would change. Um, and that, to me, seems really important in order to have an informed discussion about you know, what is our objective and how would that be reflected in the thresholds? One final question. Let's go here. Thank you. They're coming. <laughs> Please identify yourself. Hi, yeah, Rob Finn from the Center for Community Progress. Thank you again. Um, a question about opportunity zones. I know um, the OCC and FDIC proposal has specific treatment for uh, investment in opportunity zones and just to see what the Federal Reserve's approach and thinking around how opportunity zones either fit or don't necessarily fit in an agnostic way in what the Federal Reserve is thinking of proposing. Yeah, so there, um, there may well be really good opportunities in uh, those zones. I think uh, we've thought a lot about this issue as, with the other agencies um, and in discussion um, with stakeholders. I think uh, our sense is uh, that we would want to make sure to maintain um, the same uh, uh, general um, uh, connection to the statute's core purpose in making those assessments. Um, so we would want to continue ensuring that those investments um, are actually um, serving uh, LMI families, LMI areas. And uh, so it would, uh, again, further the core purpose uh, of the statute. And we think that makes sense with a reading of the statute. So I'm struck that uh, almost every single one of your answers were to return to um, evidence-based policy making. <laughs> what a refreshing approach. So um, uh, with that, um, first of all, thank you very much you. for sharing your analysis uh, and for uh, doing it here, uh, and also for the transparency that has been provided and will be forthcoming, uh, which we're very excited about. Uh, please join me in thanking and gut for Thank you. Thank you.